Looking at a subversion session shows several potential security issues. The user types a command into the client. The client determines that it needs to contact the server, so it initiates contact. The server processes the request, accessing the relevant repository and sends the data back to the client. The client presents the information to the user. There are three main areas of security we need to attend to. One, the working copy. Two, data moving across the network between the client and the server. And three, the server. At the server, we have two main concerns. One, the server checking that the client's request is permitted. Two, securing the repository file system to prevent accidental or malicious damage. The working copy is a set of directories and files that your client manages. Subversion does not encrypt or protect the content of the working copy in any way beyond the weak protection afforded by the SVN needs lock property that we'll look at in session 8 of this module, repository centric commands. If you need to secure your working copy, you will need to look into encrypting the file system on which it is hosted. Why might you want to do this? The common reason is when the files in the working copy contain sensitive information and the working copy is held on a portable device such as a laptop or a USB drive. The next security issue is the data moving between the client and server. As we shall see as we look more closely at this exchange, there are a number of different strategies for securing this information. The main considerations are the initial exchange of security information like usernames and passwords, the subsequent exchange of data from the repository to the working copy, the transmission of file contents and directory structures, log entries and any other information supplied to the user from the repository or from the user to the repository. Finally, we need to look at the security on the server. This we divide into two areas. The subversion server determines who the user is and then determines whether the user has the rights to perform the operations they've requested. And we need to examine the security of the repository file system on the host server. Ensuring the exchange of usernames and passwords is secure enough for your needs should be your first concern. After all, if your user's username and passwords are compromised, then so is your repository and everything in it. On an internal network, you may not need to secure this username and password exchange since the likelihood that the username or passwords will be intercepted by someone who should not gain access to the repository are small. If your client is communicating over an insecure network, such as the internet, then you may need to secure the username and password exchange. Most basic subversion installations use basic authentication. Basic authentication will pass the username and password pretty much in open text. The password is weakly encrypted. If you need to secure this exchange, you will need to use a more secure encrypted method of exchanging the username and password. One way to secure this communication is to use a virtual private network, VPN for short. A full discussion of VPNs and how to set one up is beyond this course. Contact your network administrators if you want to use a VPN to secure your client-server communications. A VPN essentially extends your internal network out across an unsecured network by providing a secure encrypted tunnel through which the client can communicate. The client sees the server as if it were on a local network and there's no need for subversion to do anything to secure its communications with the server. The VPN encrypts any information that the client sends to the server, then passes the encrypted data to the server where the VPN decodes it and passes it onto the subversion server. The subversion server sees the data as if it had come from an unencrypted client running on the local network. Similarly, when the server sends reply data to the client, the VPN encrypts it on the server and passes it to the client. The client then decodes the encrypted data and the subversion client sees the data as if the subversion client were on the local network. The advantage of using a VPN is that you, as the subversion administrator, don't need to worry about securing the data exchange between the client and the server. 
it's all taken care of by the VPN. Using a VPN does, however, require administration by the network administrator. Also, it assumes that you know in advance who will run the client. If, for example, you're running a repository that will be accessed by many users, most of whom work for different organizations and they come and go on the project, it may be difficult to get each of the users to connect through a VPN. VPNs work best for site-to-site -site communication, for example, between your organization and a third-party development organization, or when, for example, a user needs to remotely access the repository and their laptop is set up for VPN communication with your network. Most corporate laptops use a VPN to connect to the corporate network when working remotely. If you can't use a VPN, or you have some users who cannot use a VPN, uh, Subversion offers other methods of encrypting the username and password exchange. In order for client and server to securely exchange username and password over an insecure network, they'll both need to speak the same language. Both client and server need to be capable of using the same encryption. Prior to version 1.5 of Subversion, you were limited to using either Apache or SSH to secure this exchange. As of 1.5, many client and servers can use the Cirrus SASL library. SASL is short for Simple Authentication and Security Layer. And Cirrus SASL is just one implementation of this SASL standard. This provides the ability to use a variety of secure methods to exchange the username and password. If you have clients that cannot use the SASL library, perhaps some users have the 1.4 client, these can communicate with your 1.5 server, albeit with some restrictions, then exchange of usernames will have to be done using basic authentication if you use the Subversion SVN server. In Subversion, this basic authentication is done using a method called CRAMMD5, short for Challenge Response Authentication Mechanism Message Digest Algorithm 5. If you use Apache as your Subversion server, then you have more choice about the authentication mechanism. In fact, you can use any authentication mechanism supported by Apache. The exchange of username and password is commonly done using HTTPS, that's the SSL encryption, uh, just like any secure website on the internet. If you use SVN plus SSH, then this operates a little like an ad hoc VPN. There are some important differences that I discuss in session 6.3, SSH and SVN serve. The Subversion SVN serve server is used, but it expects that the user has been authenticated by an external system in this case SSH, and does nothing itself to authenticate the user. The other data that we exchange between client and server is the data from the repository, not least of which are the files and folders. These data are by default not encrypted in any way, like the exchange of username and password, you may decide that the network is already secure enough and no further action is required. Or you may already have a VPN set up, and this secures not only the username and password exchange but also all the data that flows between the client and server. What if we have to cross an insecure network and have no VPN? Does the protection we've set up for the exchange of username and passwords extend to other data flowing between the client and server? Well, probably not. If you've set up Apache to use SSL encryption, then all traffic exchanged using HTTPS protocol will be protected. If you're using SVN plus SSH, then all traffic will be protected by the SSH wrapper. If you're using SVN, then the data is not necessarily protected. If you're using a client and server that both have Cirrus SASL built in and you have configured them appropriately, then your data can be protected. Each of these options is described and discussed in more detail in session six of this module, Servers, when I cover the installation of each server type in more detail. Finally, we need to consider the security of the repository file system itself. Whether you're using the FSFS or Berkeley DB to support your repository, 
they're both stored on a file system and this file system needs to be protected from both accidental and malicious damage. If you choose to use the file protocol to access your repository, then the only protection available is that offered by your operating system and the file system. As such, you will need to provide both read and write access to the repository file system. It should be obvious why this poses a potential security problem. Every user that requires access to the repository's virtual file system requires the same access to the repository's physical file system. This means that any user with write access to the virtual file system can manipulate the physical repository files too, and in so de doing could irretrievably corrupt them. If you use the SVN plus SSH protocol, you face similar issues securing the repository file system as when using the file protocol. Each user accesses the repository through a local account on the host server. The SVN serve process runs under that local user's account and therefore requires that this local user has the same direct access to the repository's physical file system. This is covered in more detail in section 6.2 SSH and SVN serve. If you use either the SVN serve or Apache servers, you will want to secure your repository file system, allowing only the server program and the subversion administrators to access these files. Now, what about securing access to the repository itself? We've spoken at some length about exchanging username and password. This presupposes we need a username to identify our users. We may be willing to provide users with anonymous access, not requiring a username or password for some operations. For example, we may be willing to allow anyone who has access to our subversion server to read the repository's content. This is quite a common setup for open source project repositories and repositories that are hosted and accessed within the same local network. Anyone who can connect to the repository can read the content of the repository. It is uncommon for repositories to allow updates without the user identifying who they are. If users are not identified against modifications, the log message shows no author, which is not very helpful when trying to figure out who did what. So, we need to decide whether we're going to allow just anyone to read information from our repository or write information into our repository. Also, we need to decide whether we, we want the repository to log information about which user has modified the content of the repository. If we decide that we do indeed want the repository to secure our data, and this is certainly the most common setup, we need some way for the users to be identified. This is done through authentication, and I will be presenting this next. We then consider what users are able to do within our repository. This is dealt with by authorization, which we turn to later.